Yeah. So I'm looking at the strategies to reduce human trafficking and protect the human rights of the vulnerable group. And I will start by saying that I ceased to be the special UN Special Rapporteur on trafficking July 31st, 2014, after six years at the job from 2008 uh, to uh, 2014, July. Um, and I'm now acting in another capacity as a member, I was appointed by the Secretary General at, to the UN Trust Fund on trafficking for, for victims of human trafficking. Uh, and there are five uh, trustees uh, representing different regions of the world, and I'm representing Africa on that. And this is also managed by UNODC Secretariat from Vienna. So that is the role. But for six years, of course, uh, is, a, is a long time doing this work and, and then also being involved in, in a lot of work targeted at gender-based violence, uh, both uh, in Nigeria, Africa, and with the UN Special Rapporteur, it was all over the world. And I would like to start uh, by sharing uh, some of the survivor stories in many countries that I undertook a UN uh, mission in, in my capacity as a special rapporteur. I, I recall um, one of the survivor stories uh, uh, when I went to my last year, I was in Central America, in Belize in particular. I, I, I have to th th tell this story, they, this just sharing quick stories from these strips. One said, I have to forget, it is hard, but I need to fight hard to put this behind me. She kept repeating while sobering three years after her ordeal. The now 20 year, 20, 18 years old girl from Guatemala was smuggled into Belize when she was 13 on a promise of a babysitting job. She, um, instead, her trafficker, a woman originally from Guatemala who grew up in Belize, took her to work in a bar in a small village where she was made to sell her body, never paid, and was deprived of her freedom, threatened from detention for entering the country irregularly, and abused with the complicity of a local police officer. Three years after being rescued, the victim has not received proper social assistance or psychological support, although she now feels at ease living with the foster family who is hosting her. She remains anonymous, three years under the protection of the Belizean government. She has not been issued a resident permit because the few requests made to the Guatemalan authorities for identification document remains unanswered. In, uh, in uh, Italy, I met a uh, a Nigerian girl, a 21-year-old Nigerian girl who traveled by plane from Nigeria, transiting through Turkey, Serbia, Hungary, and Slovenia before arriving in Italy by train. Not only was she trafficked, but she was held in debt bondage as her father back in Edo State of Nigeria had put up his land as collateral for a down payment of the 60,000 euro fees demanded to bring her to Europe. The young woman was moved from Turin to Milan and to Paris to engage in prostitution <coughs> in order to repay her debt. She was rescued following a random identification check in Italy where she now benefits from assistance. However, X has to lie to her parents about her detention as they are still asking her to send money to repair the debt from her traffickers. The traffickers have continued to threaten her family back in Nigeria since uh, the, her disappearance from their radar. Um, finally, I want to share this story from my country visit to Philippines uh, in 2012, where I met several victims of trafficking, especially between 12 and 22 years old who had been trafficked mostly from Mindanao region of uh, region to Cebu. And I want to underline this Mindanao, because those who know about uh, this is the conflict region in Philippines, to also see the, 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 the nexus with this and other forms of violence, to Cebu and Manila for prostitution. In many cases, the young girls and women who had either run away from home to escape their parents' physical or sexual abuse or wanted to alleviate the economic situation of their families. 
they approached, you know, she was approached by a neighbor or a friend for help. However, the neighbor friend deceived them with fake employment opportunities and took them to big city where they were forced into prostitution. Victims were made to work continuously from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. irrespective of their health conditions and were confined to the, to the bar. As payments are made directly to the owners of those or the pimps, they receive no money at all. One child victim also reported that when she became pregnant, she was put in a house with several other women and girls who were either pregnant or had already given birth. When she gave birth, unknown persons forcefully took her baby away from her. Thereafter, she was forced back into prostitution until the day she escaped and went to the police. And I recall meeting this young girl, and she was still telling me she's haunted by the child that baby, and they said the baby was so beautiful, and it was uh, a German uh, boyfriend who came to the to the brothel, who, and he said it's just mix and it's so beautiful. How can I ever find my baby? Can you help me find my baby? So, the the issue of uh, human trafficking, when, when we talk about it, I always say we can uh, look at this from from a number of ways. You can look at it from labor and migration, you can look at it from criminal justice, you can look at it from human rights perspective, you can look at it from crime. But it's, it's an integrated approach. It, it really involves a lot. And, and when you're looking at it, you may decide to look at the structural violence, but I know it's more of we are looking at also the, the physical violence that also results in the process of trafficking on the continuum of trafficking and, and, and uh, all of that uh, are very important. And what I've seen, we know of course trafficking doesn't affect only women. We know trafficking affects men, women, and children. But I think it's an incontrovertible truth that it affects majority of women and girls. And that, that sexual abuse, why it becomes like a, a double jeopardy, is, is because it's, it's just so heinous. People, of course, uh, labor traffic victims can go through tremendous physical exertion. But in, in addition to that, when it is uh, women are trafficked or girls are trafficked for sex trafficking. They have a lot of multiple other risks, you know, apart from the rape, their bodies, and so many things. And, and this, the trauma is, uh, is so difficult to deal with. But also when one of, part of the way we do our work at the UN, apart from thematic report to General Assembly and Human Rights Council that I do every year, looking at the global situation, is to undertake country visit and then look at the country as a whole. Look at the institutional mechanism for dealing with this issue because we know trafficking is a form of violence and is intertwined chiefly with you know, gender-based violence. And when you look at the root causes even of other forms of violence, especially violence against women, you find that they are, they are, they are quite linked. Is to look at that, then look at what support services, what action the government is taking in order to prevent trafficking. <coughs> Actually, I have like 11 pillars of framework that I developed that I also use to, to, to really examine the, the countries and meet with uh, various stakeholders, government, international organization, and civil society, and the victims, whenever I do a country visit, is the, f the, the five Ps. Uh, the five Ps, which is about uh, protection, prevention, prosecution, punishment of traffickers, and partnership, promoting international uh, cooperation to dealing with trafficking. So the three R's that have to do with uh, redress, recovery, and reintegration. The recovery aspect is just another substitution for rehabilitation. So, and then when I look at the three C's, there will be the gaps in practice around capacity building, capacity gap, uh, coordination gap, and then um, cooperation, because we know that uh, because of the transnational nature of trafficking, that uh, it knows no border, and no one country can, can, can control it, that you have source country transit and destination of favored countries. And within that, it is uh, international cooperation is imperative uh, for combating that. So when you look at the system, is it that the countries, they have the law, but even when they have the law, the institutions may not be there, the law may not also uh, really define trafficking comprehensively in a way it takes care of all other forms of trafficking. In some cases, you actually have just trafficking prohibited against children. And you're wondering what happens to those children who are women or when they move beyond 18 years and, and they become adolescent. It, it, they fall into general problem that adolescent doesn't have a discernible legal status in many national uh, countries. And, and this is also uh, very important. So when um, we are looking at the, the numbers, I said numbers, the scale of human trafficking. 
the scale is huge. But again, we have problem with reliable statistics. Because sometimes, even from extrapolation from what I've met thousands of victims, myself directly, we are victims. And I said, are we sure of this number we are talking about? When we are even looking and saying maybe 2.5 at any one point is entrapped in a situation of trafficking, or 800 women and girls are trafficked every year. If we're just talking of transnational trafficking, maybe close, but I think it's still a problem. Quality data is scarce in this area. And then but when we include internal dynamics, internal human tra trafficking, and affecting children in particular, and women then, we're talking of millions of people affected, definitely beyond all that has been captured from, from my experience. So trafficking by its nature, characteristics and consequences, is intertwined with violence chiefly directed at the female gender and shares underlining causes with also violence against women, which includes unequal power relations, gender inequalities, feminization of poverty, sexual objectification and commercialization of women, ingrained sex stereotypes and, and gender-based discrimination. You see, gender-based violence for long, before they created the mandate at the UN of Special Rapporteur on Trafficking, that was created in 2004. It was this UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women that usually take also the part of trafficking. And then with the UN system talking a lot more about collapsing, merging, resource uh, issues, um, they will also talk about what mandates uh, do we merge and collapse and, and when people talk about trafficking, violence, there were of course a lot of arguments why it should be kept separate. Trafficking already is huge. Violence against women is already huge. If you put that together, it's, 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 it's tremendous. I did a 10 years uh, sort of stock taking of the, of the mandate that was created in 2004 by then Commission on Human Rights, now Human Rights Council. And uh, this year was the, the, the 10th year. And, and in this first decade of the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Trafficking in Person, I tried to, to really even also make the argument why this, of course, has to be an, an the amount of work. So you can imagine when it's an addendum of violence against women, what are the issues? And now we see a lot of it cross, uh, crossing, and many other my colleagues, even the torture mandate, telling us, oh, this is what I'm finding. This is what even the racial, you know, so many. So. It is uh, indeed a huge problem. In terms of political will, it's always there. The government will tell you, oh, we, we, all, we, we hate uh, trafficking, we support uh, action, any action to stop trafficking. Uh, but whether they are addressing those, especially uh, issues around prevention uh, is important, and then also addressing the root causes of trafficking, which is also linked very much with the realization of the goals of uh, Millennium Development Goals. And when we are looking at uh, the post-millennium agenda, I made a forceful argument even at the UN to make sure we have these issues and the trafficking and the linkages are set out clearly uh, to, 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 uh, in, in, post, uh, in the post-MDG. So if, um, if we are looking, I think what is important in this session is more to think about, it's not just about the problem because we all know the problem. I don't think anybody is in doubt anymore. Uh, that uh, trafficking doesn't exist. I mean, I've, I can tell you, I've seen thousands of victims, and I can go on and on in terms of sharing the experience. Uh, one of my last report to General Assembly was even looking at the issue of uh, trafficking for the purpose of organ transplantation. And people were surprised about how huge this area is growing. And increasingly, people are trafficking for begging. You pointed that out. And it's also a phenomenon I've documented, that these are emerging forms, and, and the forms are, they are endless, you know, the, in terms of the exploitation it fosters and the violence also uh, the aftermath and, and the whole violence in the continuum of, uh, of the trafficking. So for prior to the adoption of the UN protocol, that is the UN uh, protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in person, which is supplementing the United Nations Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, uh, the Beijing Declaration that was after the World Conference on Women was the one that succinctly captured in its paragraph 121 the fact that trafficking is a form of violence. And undoubtedly, efforts to combat trafficking in persons will not be effective unless they are centered on universal respect for human rights of all individuals. 
particularly trafficked persons and those at the risk of being trafficked. Victims of trafficking <laughs> suffer grave violations of their fundamental human rights. Therefore, it is crucial that any response uh, to trafficking be constructed around the common goal of remedying such violations. And I spent quite a number of, a, a number of uh, years working on effective remedies for victims of trafficking and developing a draft uh, rules, which eventually with the UN mandate, I had a global consultation around the world and it came out again. I pass it on to them, hoping it can transform to some kind of soft international law that state can begin to look at it as, as, as a, a yastic to incorporate different interventions that will help uh, vulnerable victims. So the, the victims of trafficking, looking at the collateral damage, what they suffer, effective and sustainable fight against trafficking needs to be hinged on these 11 uh, pillars that I've mentioned before, protection, prosecution, prevention, punishment, promotion of international cooperation, and victim-centered centered approach of three hours, redress, rehabilitation or recovery, and reintegration and the three C's of capacity coordination and cooperation guided by international human rights standards and, 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 and law. There is a linkage that I want to bring to the fore between, of course, Millennium Development Goals and tackling the root causes of trafficking. By addressing different aspects of poverty, the MDGs are intrinsically linked to the factors that increase vulnerability of, uh, of people to trafficking. And again, in analyzing the MDGs, it is important to know that MDGs, by the fact that they are the fact of helping to reduce vulnerability of people to trafficking, constitute an important contribution uh, to the prevention of trafficking. S several authors, of course, have uh, reported that the majority of prevention policies adopted to combat trafficking are mainly focused on increasing public awareness and education and consider also that you know, vulnerably. Some of them have problems because we don't have also monitoring and evaluation of even some of the prevention effort to see the ones that cause stigmatization and the ones that can make people go underground. There were situations where we found if you say everybody traffic is traffic for sexual exploitation and they are traffic to they become prostitutes. Nobody want to talk about it. I met a lot of people on, uh, when I did a mission to United Arab Emirates and women from other Arab countries who say they will never tell people what they've gone through. When they get back home, they don't want to assess support services. They wouldn't want to be identified as trafficked persons or they have been forced into prostitution because they know that they will be seen as damaged goods or as spoiled goods. In, uh, okay, good. So, then given also uh, that, I would like to go quickly to just uh, my conclusion. And this conclusion uh, is based on uh, five A's, and I like uh, alphabet a lot. Alphabet, and <laughs> I'm trying to make it easy. <laughs> he doesn't help that I'm a teacher. <laughs> um, but these five A's is around, uh, crafted around, one is awareness. Raising awareness and also building capacity so that people understand the phenomenon of human trafficking and then uh, they appreciate it and have knowledge. Because identification is the major problem. There are times people say, oh, I didn't even know I was trafficked. Or the police say, we didn't know this is a traffic case. I go to countries, I visit prisons, I visit detention centers. I'm able to see this is not, you don't treat traffic persons as irregular migrants. There should be diverse. And then I say, this, these are the case. What checklist, what tools have you got in doing that? For the businesses in the supply chain, how do you ensure trafficking free supply chains? How do you, what mechanism do you put in place? So it is important that we have capacity around, around this. Um, assistance to traffic persons and those vulnerable is very important. If you give them assistance, they get empowered, they have the confidence, they can report and they can fight their traffickers. Otherwise, they are incapacitated and then uh, they wouldn't see even an incentive in reporting. And they will be, it will be actually what the traffickers have told them. If you report, You'll be deported. You'll be done. This will be done to you. You will be criminalized. And, and, and then the, if all those things happen to them, if you don't provide assistance, then the traffickers are right and they will continue to act with impunity. Again, the third A is action towards MDG implementation to tackle some sort of uh, the, the, the root causes of trafficking and irregular migration because it's important. You must have heard in the news about people who drowned in the boat, 500. And this I saw in Lampedusa. You go every day. People are... And then you see these young girls that are coming and with the breakdown in Libya, they are just trooping, you know, it's free now. People just come from Libya to Italy to, and they are telling them, even for the young girls, say you are above 18. 
so that way they don't even get services. And I'm looking at them in detention center. I said, this, what class are you? And some of them from Africa, I knew clearly they were under 18. And this also I saw in Philippines. They will come and declare false age in order to travel. But then the government have got a good response. Now they test them right there at the airport for test for age. And they are seen and they have stopped during my mission over 40,000 under age from, from traveling. Of course, we don't want women to be prevented from traveling, for migration, for any living, because there could be part of collateral damage in that. But then we have to put systems in place because traffickers are smart and they are using all kinds of things in order to, so they don't get the help they need if they say they're adults. And for many countries that wouldn't recognize that for adults, then uh, it's easy for them to do. So the fourth one is alliance, public-private partnership. I don't think I can go on, to all of us understand the need for this. And uh, because of time, I wouldn't go into great detail. But the cooperation is imperative in order to prevent and combat human trafficking. Even businesses have to get involved. Um, finally, accountability, promoting state accountability. To ratify many international instruments, about 159 countries are parties to the UN protocol. And I'm saying for the remainder of the state, I tell the government all the time, does it mean you support trafficking? I was in St. John's College here in Cambridge in 2012. Um, only to, uh, I found out that both uh, William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson attended the St. John's College here. And they were very instrumental, key to the abolitionist movement, to the abolition of slave trade over 200 years ago. And I was wondering, as we are marking the first World Day Against Trafficking declared by UN this July. What would these great men think about our world? Where trafficking still goes on unabated? Where we still, human beings are still being trafficked? Long, long ago after it, it was abolished. And there are new forms emerging every day. So the states must be able uh, to, to, to enact appropriate national legislation to criminalize all forms of trafficking and to protect uh, uh, children, women, vulnerable persons from the violence fostered by trafficking. But importantly, I think there should be safe migration options, not necessarily restrictive migration, have not been proved to, to be helpful in this area. Uh, there is need for, for due diligence to prevent, investigate, and punish uh, acts of trafficking, whether perpetrated by state actors due to corruption. There is a lot of police implication in Thailand when I went on mission, in other countries, in Philippines. And you see how the police are implicated because they turn a blind eye or the immigration and then let the traffickers have a field day. So we have to target all of this. And I think they are also very good for, for even targeting in the broader uh, prevention of violence uh, cases. National plan of action is one of the key things I've recommended under this. And having a national rapporteur especially things that can improve data collection at national level, so that whatever intervention, uh, especially in these uh, competing resource uh, scarce countries, it will be evidence-based, and you can know what prevalent uh, form of trafficking and how to tackle that, and then also have evaluation in built to monitor progress. Thank you very much.